from us, JTG, IT Society Summer School. Um, let me just have a brief introduction uh, to this afternoon lectures. Um, if you think of evolution, one of the first names that uh, come to our mind is Charles Darwin. But in our field, we are talking about density evolution. And one of the foremost in this, uh, when it comes to density evolution, is Professor Rodrigo Urbange. And um, he has won almost all the awards in information theory community. And uh, in fact, a staggering list of 18 awards that he is associated with listed at his website. So there's a lot more to say. We can't say a short bio. I'll rather say some a few words based on my own experience of spending some six years along with him at uh, EPFL in the information processing group. Uh, in fact, we were one of the first set of students who were taught this course, Modern Coding Theory by Professor Urbange, and uh, had a lot of uh, genesis and early developments of uh, so-called probabilistic decoding and things like that were covered extensively in those, uh, those lectures. We had so much of uh, uh, thresholds and bifurcations and convergence. We used to wonder it's some kind of uh, nonlinear analysis course or something like that. But then over the years, uh, this course has been evolved as he does iteratively call it evolved into this fantastic book, Modern Coding Theory, which is one of the classic in that field. Um, less known to people outside information theory community, Professor Urbange has also done or come up with a scheme called rate division multiple axis or uh, rate splitting multiple axis along with his uh, advisor, Professor Rimaldi. And uh, it's our uh, fortune to have him deliver the afternoon lectures, which will be on how physics, computer science, and perhaps Rudiger Urbange came together to deliver better quotes. Let's hear it from the man himself. And I invite Professor Rajesh to Welcome, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's a great pleasure because I see many familiar faces that I haven't seen uh, in a while. And it's a particular pleasure. And I would like to thank the organizers, in particular, CB, um, for, for inviting me here. Um, I still fondly remember the years he was there. He was one of our first generation students. And uh, you know how it goes. It typically just goes downhill from there. OK, so this is always the generation we, we refer backwards. So um, what I would like to do is, uh, is in the first hour, I'll try to give you a little bit some overview about some basic ideas. What I really love about uh, coding theory is that, and I hope I can convey this in the first hour, is that there's a very concrete um, task, right? taking information from one place to another, from one point in time for another. They're very well-defined models. These models are very simple, but surprisingly, they have been extremely accurate in their predictions for practical systems. Um, and we understand very well what the fundamental limits are. We know what the Shannon capacity is. And we have limitations on computational power and so on. And if you go back since from 1948, uh, where this problem was first formulated by Shannon and then coding really uh, perhaps goes more even back to Richard Hamming. Uh, since then, there are probably five, six, seven really nice ideas, different ideas, and they go back to all kinds of uh, problems. You know, math, of course, has played a, role, role, a, a huge role, algebra, et cetera. And so I would like to just survey a little bit these ideas. And so what's so nice about this is that you know, it doesn't matter if you're algebraically inclined or you're probabilistically inclined or, or uh, you know, as long as you're inclined in some way, okay, you can, you can work on that. And uh, so it, it's very nice and you can contribute. And it's also something that, um, you know, actually has some, some real world impact. And it's probably one of the areas where, uh, you know, let's see, traditional engineering areas where there's a very small jump from you know, something that might look fairly theoretical and abstract to actually something, uh, you know, that's in, in standards, right? So, of course, I'll, I'll survey a little bit, but the latest one, for example, polar codes, right? Uh, they're already now in the uplink control channel, and, you know, what was it, 2008, 
right? So that's eight years from, uh, you know, maybe it will be a few more years until you actually see it in your phone. Uh, but, you know, there are not many areas of engineering where you can think of some nice mathematical problems and then perhaps if you're, if you're lucky, you know, 10 years later, there's something that you actually carry in your pocket. Okay, so that's what I would like to do. Um, just since it's not good to start with a mistake, okay, uh, let me just correct this, okay. I don't know how this happened, okay, sorry. Okay, anyway, good. So, um, since probably people have very different backgrounds, as I said, the first hour, I'll just do an overview and then we get started with the actual, um, you know, topic. So, uh, what do we, what we're interested in? Well, we're interested in, we had, you know, very nice, uh, you know, very uh, topical thing today by Ashish uh, talking about social computing. This is much more classical, okay? So we're talking about something of, you know, it's like 70 years old, okay? And that picture hasn't changed in 17 years, okay? It, I didn't take it from 17 years ago, but uh, because Keynote didn't exist, but they could have been drawn 70 years ago. So we have information and we want to send this information from a send from a source to a destination, and we have some particular channel model, and so this classical stand, uh, channel models, everything is that I'll talk about will be binary, everything will be memoryless, okay, and uh, typically I also restrict myself to what's called symmetric channel, um, you know, it's once you know how to handle this, many, many other things can be handled with, and so the, the classical channels, there are three, the binary ratio channel, you take a bit, you simply erase it or don't erase it every bit independently, binary symmetric channel, take a bit, you either flip it or don't flip it, again, independently, or the additive white, uh, binary additive white Gaussian noise channel where you simply add additive noise to it. And most of, when I ever talk, I will actually always talk about the binary ratio channel because everything is much easier to explain. Uh, the ideas are the same, uh, it's just the math is simpler, and once you understand that, the rest is more or less just epsilons and deltas, and so I will skip that. Okay, so we take the information. The information uh, might be perturbed, that's what we're receiving. And the way we do it is we use what's called a block code, and so our code, and so uh, in a block code, so we have code words, okay, and we have, um, uh, have a certain length, and everything is gonna be here binary, and of course we need many of them, so by our choice of the word that we pick, that's the information we wanna transmit, and of course there are many of them, right? If you want to send k bits of information, you need two to the k code words, and that's exactly what makes things difficult, because um, you know these lengths might be thousands or even millions that are used in practice, rates might be, let's say, a half, so two to the whatever, a million times a half, that's a very large number, that's what makes things complicated. Good, now what are we interested in at the end? In the simplest case, and we'll get back to it uh, to talk about much you know, more in detail, but at the end we have somehow a channel, and typically we don't have one channel, we have a family. So for example, the binary erasure channel is parameterized by its erasure probability, and so let's assume that's the binary erasure channel with the, uh, with the erasure um, probability here. This is good here, the channel is bad here, and then we're interested in some probability of error. What's the probability that we can decode correctly? And this could be the probability of error decode correctly the block, or could be the probability of error decoding a bit that we're interested in. And so then typically we don't just have also one, uh, when we talk about coding, we don't typically don't just have one code, but there's of course the block length that's very important in there. And so we have families of codes that somehow have the same parameter or the same kind of behavior, like iterative, and I'll talk about various versions. And the hope is that, that as the length becomes larger, if we're plotting these curves here, right, that we get closer and closer to this capacity limit. So given that I have a particular channel and a particular um, you know, rate of the code, there's a worst parameter that I should be able to tolerate, the worst channel that I should be able to transmit reliably over, and the hope, that, the hope is that we get closer and closer to this. Okay, so there's of course a long, long history, okay, and so rather than going over this history, these are just some, um, you know, some of the ideas here, rather than this, I thought I'll just, um, re you know, pass a little bit uh, over some of the highlights or ideas that people did, right? So the first one is, of course, algebraic. So if you like algebra, um, you know, you were, would have been very happy in the 50s because that's where, you know, the, the height of, of this. And actually, 
turns out history is cyclic, we're gonna get back to it, okay, but that's at the end. And so what was the idea? You have a Hamming ball, right? And of course, again, this is very small. You should think of this as maybe a thousand dimensions. You're having these two to the thousand um, uh, positions and you know, picking a code simply means picking a subset of these things out of those things, and um, you know, since, since we have two to a thousand, a lot of points, algebra it can be very helpful in defining what this set of points is. And so this led to linear algebraic codes. The, the original was Hamming, uh, you know, read uh, Solomon codes, read Muller codes, BCH codes. So these are really the classics in the, in the 50s. And so um, the idea is that you wanna pack as many points, of course, in space as possible, but you want to, them to have a distance so that if things go wrong, you send something, you receive something slightly different, that mapping to the closest point with high probability gets you back, right? And so um, maybe not completely trivial uh, is that if you look at the rate of the code, so the two to the n times r words that you pick out of two to the n, and you're, picking at, you're looking at the relative distance, okay, this goes from zero to up half the Hamming distance, that you can actually get minimum distance and real rate, okay? And so these are two bounds that are, have been known for the longest time, Gilbert Weisham and Elias bound, that tell you that you can find packings that have roughly that density. So you can find a code here that has maybe whatever, 0 0.6 rate and whatever, 0 0.1, you know, the, the closest distance between any two point is still about 0 0.1 n, okay? So, so that was the idea. And the idea together with this is that if you now take a word you, you, you know, because of the channel, it somehow gets perturbed. Let's think of binary symmetric channel. That if, if you have a distance d, if you, if you get less than d over two away from, you know, from the origin, if you map back to the closest point that you can find, okay, that then you map back to the correct one. So as long as you, so you can decode correctly up to half the minimum distance, right? So that's why we're interested in last minimum distance. So, um, you know, it was known in the early days that this was neither sufficient nor necessary, okay? Uh, it was neither sufficient in the sense that even if you found the optimum packing that existed, okay, if you just did minimum distance decoding, this doesn't get you to capacity, okay? So packing is not exactly the same as transmitting reliably, okay? Although it's a, it's a very good scheme. It's also not necessary, and that was also, of course, clear in the beginning, so you don't have to solve that problem. This is one of the most difficult math problems, and so much of the theme will be that there are much easier ways of doing it, okay, that actually get you there. But it was quite successful. Um, Voyager is still out there. It's now somewhere in interstellar space. It's, I think, was launched 1977, okay? And that uses this, and, you know, I guess, Read Solomon codes are uh, used for, for this one, if you still know what that is, okay? Now, these days, I guess it's all in the cloud, okay? And of course, also for disks, until fairly recently, that's what was used. Okay, so basic ideas, right? What was the basic idea? You have the algebraic structure that defines the code, and um, you, if you have a good algebraic structure, then hopefully you get good minimum distance, and you also use the algebraic structure to do the decoding, to, the, for example, the algorithmic part, right? And um, now, for binary, that's actually the hardest problem, okay? If you go to higher alphabets, you can actually find optimum packings. These are what's called uh, read solomon codes, but they're typically not, uh, you know, they're, except for some applications for standard things like wireless or something, this is not really used, okay? But it was a very important and interesting idea. Now, next in the history came that, okay, so uh, you have this nice structure, but what we're sending is not really zeros and ones, right? We're sending signals. And so if we're sending signals, then we're in signal space. And if we're in signal space, then we have actually a geometry. And then perhaps we can use this geometry to do um, even better, okay? And so this is lattices and in particular Ungerberg's uh, trellis coded modulation. By the way, he got his Shannon Award this year, okay, and exactly for this. So what was the idea there? Well, uh, you know, you're really sending signals, you're sending pulses, or whatever, so you have, you know, think of something like Gram-Schmidt, you can, you can uh, you know, represent the signals in a signal space, right? And so, um, you know, maybe if you just signal on a one-dimensional axis, you signal whatever, zero, one, but there could be more than signals in one dimension, or you could also go into higher dimensions, right? So that's really what, what you signal with, but now you have an actual, geometry that's associated to it. And so now it's natural that we are in, you know, that we're thinking of packings in space, right? So no longer just packings on the Hamming cube, but these are now points in, let's say, Euclidean space that I pick. 
Uh, and again, I want to pick them again closely. Uh, sorry, I want to pick them that they have large distance for the same reason. Think that there's Gaussian noise that perturbs one into another one, right? Uh, I also want to pick them again packed. Why? Because the, the, you know, the, if you draw a circle around it, this has something to do with the energy that you expand in sending such a signal, and that's limited. Um, and so now it's very natural that you're asking what's are now the, you know, what are the best packings that you have actually in real space? And so, you know, again, that's a, quite a difficult problem, right? Uh, I think this was, um, I think it was Kepler who, who um, you know, who came up with that and, and claimed that this was the densest packing, but I think it was only proved very recently. So that's three dimensions, but we're talking about, again, a thousand dimensions and so on. So, um, you know, you're talking the equivalent now of these binary linear codes or algebraic codes is now lattices. Um, and so there's a nice connection between, so one way to get between the two is if you knew very good codes, uh, how could you how could you, um, good binary codes, how could you make lattices? Well, one way is take a, take a code, you know, in that, for, of that length, whatever dimension you want to pack. These are the points, and now simply take it and step, you know, stack it next to each other, okay? So you just, you just repeat this construction in all possible dimensions, right? Just think of this a cube, zero, one cube. Take this cube, and in every dimension, you stack it up, okay? So you'll get something like this, okay? And that actually, sorry? Yeah, so this is called construction A. It's, you know, it's just a way of, you, you think of everything modulo, and you get, this will give you a lattice, okay? Good, so, so this was one way to do it, and then you still have to, you know, you can't take an infinite lattice because you have, you have energy constraints, and so that would be one way um, of constructing it. But that, again, goes back to the problem, you know, if you knew very good codes, then you could do this, but, you know, we're trying to use something more about this space. And so there are many such lattices and codes, you know, connections between them, so you can see what's the connection. But in particular, Ungerbeck realized, and it was a brilliant engineering insight, is that you don't really have to solve the, the binary, you know, packing problems on the Hemming space, but, but you can use the geometry, and he used what's called this set partitioning. So in the simplest case, let's assume you, you're picking these points here, so in two dimensions, you have 16 points. And so now you, if, you, if you signal over many things, you could think if it just gives you a cube, a solid you know, cube where in each dimension you have always four, right? So, okay, that itself is not yet the lattice. You pick every point in there, right? You're just using the, the standard square lattice here. But so now what you still need to do is you need to address which of the, you know, if you want to send, let's say, this is 16 points, so this corresponds to four bits, you need to address the, those, right? So if addressing, you know, what is zero, zero, one, zero, for example, which of the points, right? And so in order to do that, he used this uh, set partitioning scheme. And so what he did is, is basically, you know, at every step you can see that the set is broken into two, and you try to do it such that at the end you get here large physical distances, right? So you get, you get, you know, there's, you have to decide of how you're actually breaking this into two, and that's, that's exactly um, the whole idea behind it. And so now he realized the following, if you're down here, let's assume you knew already that it was either this or this bit here, right, or this or this signal. This is just to define the last bit. So, so as you see, you have, you have to decide from here to here, from here to here, and then from here to here, and then still between here, right? So these are four bits in the decision process. If I give you the four bits, you go down, right? So maybe the first one is a one, the second one is a zero, then it's again a one, and then maybe one of the two still corresponds to one, right? So that's how you can do the encoding, but what about the decoding? Well, if you knew already the first three bits here, between those, if you decided right, the distance might be already so large, right, that you actually don't need any more coding on top of this thing. Because the, you know, if the, whatever, just think of the standard formula for, uh, you know, detection of two binary signals in, 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 in noise, right, the uh, Q of D over two, two sigma formula, right, if that's already, if the noise is, is not too large, then perhaps you're already fine. So he realized that it might be enough to just use some coding between these sets up here. And so if you use a smart signaling representation, set partitioning, and then a standard convolutional code just for this one stream just to decide on the top, that might be actually enough to, to get there. And it turns out that at least for wireless application or even wired application like your modems and so on, indeed you could get actually reasonably close to capacity with schemes like that. Uh, where you didn't need these incredibly powerful um, binary codes, 
and um, it didn't have immense complexity. So there was quite some advance. Um, you know, of course, there's also many other ideas. Um, just to demonstrate, you know, one thing, for example, in wireless, that you have fading channels, right? Fading channels, if you think of the two dimension, fading simply might squash one dimension completely. You might be in one dimension. It's like an erasure in this dimension. Well, if you picked points like this, right, then, and it happened that this dimension was squashed, you, you wouldn't be able to tell apart anymore, right? So what's the obvious kind of thing you would like to do? Well, if we're taking points that originally don't look like this, but we rotate them, right, even if now any dimension gets squashed, right, we'll still see it, right? Now, of course, in two dimension, that's not a big deal, but, you know, I demonstrated in two, but you have to think about it in a thousand dimension. And so, again, uh, here are some very nice ideas from algebraic geometry that come into place and that do exactly kind of this for high dimensional lattices to make sure that they're robust against fading. Okay, so this uh, was used in some other space missions, but particularly the old modems, um, you know, the ones that made all these sounds, you know, up and down. Okay, these are used exactly these kind of ideas, and it was uh, quite some step up from, from previous ones. Okay, so the idea here is that, you know, lattices are the equivalent of linear codes, right? Uh, and uh, again, you can use either some number theory or algebraic geometry to, to find very good uh, lattices, um, but also by taking now the geometry into account, it's not anymore an abstract packing problem, but we're thinking that this is packing in, in Euclidean space. Um, you can significantly reduce the problem, and you don't need to solve the most difficult problem finding good binary codes. Okay, uh, then the next thing, okay, and that's what you have now in any of your cell phones, in any of your storage disk, and, and any transmission pretty much Wi-Fi that happens. This is exactly this idea, which goes back to Gallagher in the 60s, was then kind of forgotten, and then in the 93 with Peru and Gavu and Titimashima, it, it, uh, it got started again. And so let me spend a little bit some more time because I'll, I'll later on need to refer things. So now um, we have seen there's algebra, we have seen there's geometry can we use. Now we forget about any of these things, right? So in, in algebra and geometry, both of them were still kind of packing problems. And, and the, the standard notion or one important notion was minimum distance. Now if we forget about minimum distance, okay, at, at all, okay, it doesn't exist. And we just basically think you start with an algorithm and then we design code so that they work well for an algorithm. And that's exactly this probabilistic coding and, uh, you know, they're called low-density parity codes, turbo codes, there are many, many flavors uh, of such codes, but the basic idea is the same. So uh, how does it work there? Well, um, this is a slightly larger example. It's about 20 uh, bits here. And so we have these 20 bits and now again, uh, this will be our information, but if we just left it like this, we could not recover if any of these bits were flipped or erased, right? So we need to introduce some redundancy. And so the standard way is, as in, in, in linear codes, is that we're simply using some XORs, okay? So we're using some parity checks here, and depending on where I'm connecting it, I'm just using a bipartite graph to denote this. So if this bit, this check is connected, let's say to bit six and seven, and whatever the other ones are, 10, let's say, uh, right? Then six, seven, yeah, it's 10 and 20. Then I require that I can't just choose these bits to be arbitrary, but they have to uh, sum up to zero, right? Everything is, is, is GF2, so it's modulo two. Okay, so in this case, unfortunately, there's a little bit something cut off down there, but in this case, if you have 20 degrees of uh, freedom to start with, and I have 10 degrees of freedom that I take away because I give you 10 linear constraints, and assuming that these 10 linear constraints are linearly independent, then I have 10 uh, degrees of freedom left, right? So this means I can uh, choose 10 bits um, arbitrarily, I can choose 10 bits independent, and the rest I have to fill in, right? So that's why we say that this is a code of rate a half, because out of the 20, 10 are taken away degrees of freedom, so I have 10 degrees of freedom left, and over the length 20, so I have half, I can basically transmit half a bit per code bit of, of information, right? Okay, so now what's important in this thing is that every code can be, rep every linear code can be represented like this, but what's important is here is that, um, that this bipartite graph is, in this case, a, a, a regular bipartite graph, so every node on the left has a certain fixed degree, let's call it L or DL, and every node on the right has a fixed degree. 
Of course, I can't choose this completely independently because the number of outgoing edges has to be equal to the number of ingoing edges, okay? So, but for example, if I pick three and six here, then this would be compatible that I have half the nodes here that I have here, right? So that's the idea. Okay, but as I said, we really start with an algorithm. So, okay, before I get there, um, now, these are exactly the kind of codes you have in your cell phones, just a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more structure. Um, and the way these are typically analyzed is that, uh, I'll show you the algorithm in a second, is that the analysis is not so easy if I give you a specific code and I ask you for this algorithm how it works. So the way it's done is something that's, um, you know, also kind of Shannon started, uh, which is, would be called probabilistic analysis in computer science, is that you simply look at a whole ensemble, so a whole set of such things, and you're ch simply computing how the average behaves, right? And so this means rather than looking at one such code, um, I do like in random graph theory, I give you a whole ensemble of these things, and how could I do it? Well, there's something in computer science called the configuration model, if you're thinking of random graphs, where you're thinking of sockets here, that's the degree of each node, and then all you do is picking a random permutation between these sockets and these sockets, and each time you do this, this gives you a different graph, but it's all from the same ensemble, and what we're interested in is not how one such code behaves, each of them defines a code, but how they behave in expectation, right? And then hopefully we can prove some concentration that they actually, you know, that this, that this expectation is meaningful and then perhaps also can expurgate if, you know, if we have low probabilities of things going wrong, et cetera. Uh, but that's beyond what I wanna say here. Okay, good. So now what's important here is that um, we wanna do the decoding and so the decoding, let me just skip this right away, the decoding is done in this very simple manner. And I guess we have heard before, and she's talking about, I guess he didn't call it, maybe he called it message passing, I can't remember, right? But that's, that's a very similar uh, idea. It's called also belief propagation, except here this means something very specific because typically it's according to rules of probability. So, um, uh, you know, but it's, it's again an iterative algorithm, very similar to what, uh, what you have shown for, um, I guess this was, uh, I forgot the prompt. Okay, collaborative filtering, okay, thank you, okay? So, so how does this go, right? So you have, um, again, you should think of this a thousand, but it's very simple, this is the code, you have three degrees of freedom, you have two checks, they're linear independent, so there's really only one degree of freedom, so there are really only two code words. Zero, zero, zero fulfills it, and then there's one other choice of zeros and ones you can fill it in that fulfill these two checks, right? So there are really only two code words, it's very trivial. But now let's assume I get that, and that should be also a question mark. And so how is now the idea of this message passing? I'll just show it to you for the binary erasure channel. For general channels, there's probabilities involved sending this, but the idea is very similar. Well, the idea is that I'm sending um, locally, the locally, my locally best estimate at any point in time. So if I receive a zero here, then I'll send according to each outgoing edge my estimate I have, in this case I know it's zero, right? And then here, since I have a question mark, I can only send out a question mark, right? And I send this to the right-hand side, and now I'm hoping that I can use these checks to do something, right? And for the binary ratio channel, that's very trivial, right? When can I use a check to give me anything, right? Well, it's the XOR of things, right? And if I know, ex if there's, if I know everything except one input, right, then I can define the rest, because this other thing has to be the, the modulo two sum of the of the remaining ones, right? That's clear, right? So um, now if you look here, for example, I know, I don't know what this is, but I know that the modulo two sum of this and this must be zero. So what must this be? Obviously this must be zero, right? But if you look here, I have two question marks. So, uh, you know, of course I know that this one was here zero, but I can neither tell what this or this is. I can jointly tell that this would be either zero, zero or one, one but I cannot greedily tell at this point, right? And so since I'm, I'm greedy here and I only have a local point of view, so it's a, it's a local message passing algorithm, all I do is I compute along every edge what I can do. So if, as we said, down here I cannot say anything, these will all be question marks, but up here I can tell that in this direction this should actually be a zero, right? And now I send it back, and so I've actually decoded this, and so now in the next round, I can do, I'm, I'm skipped now one round, I can go on and hopefully this will actually converge to the correct thing, okay? Now in general, these are beliefs, these are probabilities, 
So I have a probabilities of being either zero and one at the left side, I send it to the check, I do the compilation, computation, I send back what I think for each bit according to what the other ones say, and hopefully this thing will converge, right? So that's the message passing algorithm. And so um, if you do the analysis for this, um, then um, it turns out, I'll get back to it later on. So, so this is, for example, the erasure channel. This would be the erasure probability, right? And so um, this is erasure probability 0 to 1, and this is the probability of, uh, that I can actually decode here. And so what, what should you think, what's the experiment that you should think of? You take one of these codes, so let's say a 3-6 code, but of a very large length, let's say a length of a million, right? Now you pick a code word at random. It turns out since everything is symmetric, you can pick any code word. It doesn't depend on which code did you actually send. So let's send, let's say, the old zero code word. Of course, you don't tell the receiver, but you could do it, right? Now you send this code word over the channel. Maybe 30% of the, of the bits will be erased, right? Now you run this message passing algorithm back and forth, right? Now it's not hard to see that the number of erasures is monotonically decreasing, right? So this, and there's only a finite number of them, so after a certain number of iterations, this must actually converge to something, okay? And the convergence can be that either now all the bits have been decoded or you're stuck somewhere in a fixed point, right? And so now then you simply mark, you know, how many of the bits you can still not decode, right? And it's not very hard to see that, uh, so you can compute the expected value, you can also compute that this actually concentrates. And so um, it's then also not very hard, and we'll do it later on, to do the analysis actually. And it turns out that this will give you a curve like this, okay? So if your erasure probability is less than whatever, it's like 43%, then if the code becomes very large, right, then with high probability you will be able to decode. So if you have less than 43% erasures, with high probability, we will be able to decode. But if you're buff, suddenly you see this phase transition. You see that things jump and that you might get stuck in something. Okay, now how is 43%? Is this good or bad? Well, the code is a code, this one is a code of rate a half. And for the binary erasure channel, the capacity, okay, is one minus, so if, if, you, have the, if you have the erasure set, it's one minus epsilon, that's the rate. But if you think of the rate, then the maximum epsilon should be able to tolerate is one minus the rate, which is a half. So you should be able to tolerate 50% erasures. Okay, so we are not quite at capacity because we can tolerate 43%, but we are 50. But, you know, this is the first code we can come up with, right? So clearly there should be degrees of freedom to do better, and we'll talk about it, okay? Good, so, you know, what are the degrees of freedom? You can take, you know, why take a graph that all has the same degrees? You can have different degrees, and there are many, many other degrees of freedom, and one of them we'll talk about later. And this is a plot for not the binary ratio channel, just that is, this is for the Gaussian channel, which is, of course, typically people in wireless much more interesting. And so um, for, um, for the binary additive by Gaussian noise channel, so the capacity is this one, okay? Uh, so this is the capacity, and so these are for certain codes, how get you, how getting close, and this is about, when was this done? It's about 15 years ago, how close people could get. Um, now, why, does the, why is the capacity going back here? Why is it not just a number? So this is the EB over N0, so this is the signal-to-noise ratio here. This is the error probability here that you have, the residual one. Why does this go back? Well, if you want zero probability of error, or like arbitrarily small, then that's just this number here, whatever, 0 0.15 or whatever this is, right? But if you allow me to have a certain uh, error probability at the, at, the, at the end, okay, then what I could do is I could first compress my information to something slightly smaller, right? So it's just rate distortion. So let's assume you allow me uh, whatever, 10% distortion, 10% error probability, right? Then I could first compress this to something smaller and then use an optimal code for this. So this is why you could actually even do better than, than that, okay? But, uh, you know, so you could get pretty close. Okay, and then, you know, once you have this, you, there's certain parameters you can do, and so these parameters allow you to do optimization. So what this shows is that you give me a certain requirement, let's say at whatever rate a half, the error probability has to block error probability has to be at least 10 to minus four, and then there are certain parameters you have in the code, and you can try to do now optimizations to find a code that gets close, right? And ideally, it would be a code that just jumps down there, and so you can, um, you know, we have ways of how to actually uh, computing them and optimizing it. Okay, uh, let's see. Good, so where is this? As I said, 
is this pretty much in any application that you have. Okay, there are very few applications that don't use that. Okay, so key ideas. Um, at, no, at no point, at no, uh, at no point in, in what I mentioned right now did minimum distance come up, okay? Now, of course, you need some minimum distance because that, you know, if you have points that are very close that, and it's a linear code, then every code, uh, every word has, has, has an, a neighbor in that distance. And if it's too small, then simply just the chance that you confuse it with this will kill you, okay? But you don't need enormous, uh, a large minimum distance. Uh, you know, like in, in, in practice, codes of length 1,000 or something, you know, I mean, the minimum distances that you have might be maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 or something like that, okay? Depends on what you want. And that's a far cry, and that wouldn't change much if you go to a block length of a, of a million, and that's a far cry from something that's linear times the block length, okay? So, um, of course, it's low complexity. You're just using this message passing. You can use irregularity of the graph and other graph structures, and I'll tell you about one graph structure uh, in a minute. And um, it's very easy to incorporate soft information, okay? So one thing that was difficult when people talked about block codes and algebraic thing is that if you transmit, for example, a Gaussian channel, where you don't just get that the bit is either zero, one, but you get some actual soft information, right? You get, you get a value for the log likelihood that this is difficult to incorporate in algebraic coding, but it's trivial to do here. And uh, people came up with uh, capacity achieving um, codes for at least for the binary ratio channel, and for other ones you could do optimization. Now, one thing I, I know that I think many of you heard two years ago, last year, Emre? Last year? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll don't say much about it. Okay, so this is now the next idea is uh, now, um, you know, this is the information theory stream of coding because even if they didn't know anything about coding within, within two hours, you're up to date on coding theory. And that's channel polarization. Um, maybe I just skip it. Who has heard of polar codes? Who has heard of polar codes? Maybe who has not heard of polar codes? Um, maybe I skip it and anyone who is interested, I can do it in the break, okay? Because, so this is a, a very, a very uh, interesting um, way of doing coding, which is uh, purely information theoretic and it's based on the chain rule of mutual information. Uh, and essentially that's it. Um, and as we said, it's now in um, 5G, not as for the main, um, not for the main data thing that still uses LDPC, but it's used for the channel uplink or the control, sorry, the control link um, where um, it's used. So, okay, so if anyone is interested later on, I'll tell you, um, I'll tell you where it comes from, but maybe otherwise we skip. Okay, so, okay, so now uh, we come to the topic of what I want to do in the next seven hours, okay? Um, and so I want to tell you about two ideas, okay? One is very closely related to this iterative codes, um, and the other one, I will see that history has come full circle, and we have to go back to algebraic codes, okay? And I want to uh, tell you a little bit where this comes from. And um, one, the inspiration comes from physics, okay? Now, to be precise, that's not how historically it worked, okay? Historically, it was found in coding theory, then physicists figured out that that's actually physics, and they were very upset that we found it first, okay? But now, uh, you know, the explanation is very beautiful, I think, and so um, I think it makes a lot of sense if you think about it in this way, and so this is the way I will present it. And for the second one, it will go back to algebraic codes, but the basic idea will come from computer science and will have something to do with a very classic and very beautiful um, topic in computer science, it's about thresholds of, of, of monotone Boolean functions, and so that will bring us back in particular to what's called uh, reed merlot codes, okay? Good. So, um, so here how does the story go for spatially coupling? Okay, so you have all, I don't know if any, has anyone seen that movie, James Bond? No, diamonds are forever, okay? So, of course, if you, get your, if you get your science education from James Bond movies, okay, then you will be disappointed that, of course, diamonds are not forever because, um, you know, um, carbon has many forms, right? Diamond is one, and I guess it's a stable form if you're maybe under, I don't know how many billion tons of pressure, but if you're out, uh, you know, in the pressure and temperatures that we experience here, that's actually a metastable form. 
right? Now, uh, so metastable means that it's not the lowest energy configuration, and so eventually, of course, what will happen is that this will go to this, okay? But, of course, the half times are, you know, I don't know, right? I mean, sufficiently long. I don't know if you should be worried about this, okay? Uh, you know, I don't know, just in case, okay? But, um, but the point is that it's not the, stable, the most stable form, and so eventually it will go to the other one. Now, one that uh, I don't think you need here, okay, but we need in Switzerland, okay, these are heat packs, okay? And so if you go skiing and it's very cold out there, then, um, then you can buy these heat packs, and so what works is that there's a, a particular chemical in there, and there's different versions. And so, again, this chemical can come in two forms, okay, in a metastable form, that's liquid here, and in a stable form, that's kind of quasi-crystal form, uh, that's the stable form. And so, in the, but again, the, you know, it's, it's fairly stable, even though it's metastable, you know, it takes actually something to get it from one to the other one. But what happens is if you press there's somewhere, you see here, the small metal disks, if you get it started, okay, so if you start this crystallization process, uh, then what happens is that it will go from the liquid phase to the stable uh, crystalline phase. And since that has a lower energy configuration, of course, it will give off, as going from one to the other one, to give off heat, and that's why, why you get warmed, right? And so that has also the advantage that um, you can put it back into a microwave oven or in some, or in some water and bring it back to the other form, okay? Now, um, the point is, why doesn't it maybe right away or spontaneously go there and so on? is the following. So there's a nice physics explanation, uh, is, is, which is the following. So on the one hand, you have these two phases, right? So let's assume we had already a small, let's say, spherical-shaped ball in which it's, it's, it's already in, this, in the lower energy configuration inside, and outside it's still in the higher one, okay? Now there are two competing terms that you have. One, so now you're asking, will it grow, this crystal, or will it collapse again and stay, right? Well, so on the one hand, if it grows, then there's a certain amount of volume, right? And that goes like, uh, well, it's the, it, it, it's, the volume is obviously to our third, okay? That, that you gain a little bit some in volume where it's in the lower energy state, and this brings you into a lower energy configuration, right? So that's where the physical system would like to go. On the other hand, uh, going between the two phases, there's a boundary, and on this boundary, there's some boundary energy, okay? So, so these two phases, of course, don't perfectly align, and so there's some cost in bet uh, on the boundary that you have. And so that's, of course, going like the boundary itself, right, and the, the change in the boundary, right? So one is according to R third, the other one is according to R squared, right? Now, of course, what you also have is you have you have parameters, right? Because these two things is not just R squared and R third, so one you gain, one you lose, but there are also constants in front, right? How much you gain. And so now what happens is that if, if the particle or the seed is large enough, eventually, clearly, right? You can just write down the equation, the R third will win and it will, it will grow, right? But if it's too small, right? Then it's easy to see that if you change it a little bit, then uh, the, the surface energy will win, okay, and it will collapse again, okay? So in order to get it from one to the other one, you need to uh, either start with a large enough seed, okay, so the, the keywords here is seeding, nucleation, crystallization, okay, so the nucleus is the thing that starts it, or the seed, uh, or, and then, it, then, then the crystal is the, the low energy configuration, so you need to start it with this, and so, uh, of course, if you think about it, of course, randomly these things will form, and now the question is, you know, what's the chance, what's the probability that it forms large enough so that it will actually grow, right? And that kind of, from this, you could get some rough idea about the, the half time, or not the half time, the, the time it would, yeah, would take to, to go from one to the other one. Okay, and so now um, we can use the same thing in coding. And so uh, that will be a topic of, of um, uh, a few more hours later on but let me just show you the picture. So take one of these codes that I told you before, and, and, you did, and you would have done message passing over it, okay? And now take many of them. And so now what happens, of course, um, you know, these are, you can think of this as a code. Right now they're completely uncoupled, right? But that's a code itself. So what we wanna do is not a following. We wanna couple them together. We wanna have some interaction. Okay, this will be very important. But we don't want to change the local degree structure. So, for example, if this was a code that locally had every variable node was degree 3 and every check node was degree 6, we wanted that afterwards it's the same. 
Okay, so we so locally, if you're sitting on one of these nodes and you just have limited visibility, some neighborhood, you should not be able to tell if I'm just on sitting on one such code, right, or if I'm sitting on this on this structure now that looks like a picket fence. Okay, so you can do this by maybe randomly flip. There are many ways of doing it, okay, and so we'll not be concerned uh, to do it, but again, you could randomly flip things back and forth, and so now you get something that uh, is completely, um, is completely coupled, right? Okay, so the important is that the local structure hasn't changed because the local structure hasn't changed. If I'm running the iterative algorithm on this, so if I now use this code, I, again, let's say binary ratio channel, take a large code word from this, I, I again take the bits, I, uh, I erase some of the bits and I run things. Since everything is just local, okay, this would behave identical to the underlying code that I have, okay? Because the algorithm, all it sees is the local neighborhood, and the local neighborhood is identical to the neighborhood half. If I run now 20 iterations on this and the graph is large enough so that these iterations are more or less in, like independent iteration, you will not be able to tell a difference, okay? So what we need here is now, so we, we're trying to use kind of this seeding. So what is the equivalence? The equivalence is that the iterative algorithm brings me to a metastable state, brings me in general not to the maximum likelihood decoding state, right? Um, and so I would like to go to the maximum likelihood decoding state. I'm, I'm just get stuck in some local fixed point. That's the metastable state. So what we need is some kind of seeding, okay? We need somewhere that this decoder knows where to go, get, get started, okay? And the way we can do this, is the following. Um, there are several ways of doing it. One is that I simply take, for example, some variable nodes here, okay? And I want to do something locally that locally looks easier, the problem. And how do I do it, make it easier? If I, if I take some of these bits here and fix them to a known value, okay? So let's assume the value is zero. So I tell beforehand, so this is the code, right? And there's some code constraints. And now I add some extra constraints. And these extra constraints tell me that these values that were just thing here, all these values must be zero, okay? And that's known at the decoder and is known at the, at the receiver and at the, at the sender and the receiver, right? So this does two things. Number one, it decreases the rate a little bit, right? Because there's some bits I can no longer use for information transmission, right? So that's not good, okay? Um, now, but what will happen is the following. If these bits are known, then for all practical purposes, if you think about what the message is, what happens to them, this is like just these bits are not even there, okay? It's the same thing just because if you think of the message algorithm. So this, uh, this code, you know, what it really does, it breaks this now. And if it breaks it now, then you can really think of now rather than having a, 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 a circular code, right? You just have now a one-dimensional structure here, okay? So that's the spatially coupled structure because you have spatially coupled the different codes. And so what's important is that if you're looking at the boundary here, you, you should see, you know, if you're just like looking in here, you should see locally more blue than red, okay? And blue are the checks. So locally the code there has actually a higher, uh, sorry, has a lower rate than the code in the middle, okay? If you look in the middle and you just, you just, you can only look at something like this. This code looks locally exactly like the three, let's say the three six code we started with, and so has the same rate, let's say a half, okay? But if you're looking here, that actually has a higher rate, okay? And um, we'll see in a second what happens. Uh, has a lower rate, sorry, has a lower rate, okay? Has a lower rate, thank you, okay? And so um, an equivalence, you can use exactly the same technique in spatial coupling has been done uh, for things, for example, for um, compressive sensing, right? And so in compressive sensing, the equivalent would be that you take, the, you know, you have the compressing sensing matrix just for those that know this, right? So you have the matrix, you have your vector, right? And the measurements are you just take the vector and you multiply it with the matrix, the measuring matrix, right? And then so you get, your, you get your information and you want to recover the sparse vector here. Now in the comprehensive sensing, this, the, the, this structure here corresponds to taking a measuring matrix that is kind of like, a, has like a more diagonal or bent structure, okay? But at the boundaries, at the, at the corner points, you have more entries than the average, okay? So in, in, in expectation, you have only few entries, but there you have more entries, okay? And so given having more entries, you, you get more measurements there locally and, and hence these things work. Okay, so if you do this, now you have certain parameters, the length, blah, 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 okay? So now if you run it, okay, so if we run it 
So this is the channel, this is the channel, good channel, bad channel. And this is the 43% that I mentioned beforehand, right? So this is, this is beforehand for let's say the 3.6 code. If you run it over a binary erasure channel, that's how many erasures you could fix. Um, and so now what we have, so this was the threshold beforehand. And now we run it somewhere, okay? Namely at a threshold that's unfortunately you can't see, it, which is somewhere here. And if I run this one more time maybe, you will see that if you ignore the boundary, it basically comes down. So there are now 100 copies that are coupled, okay? And you have seen, if you run it one more time, each of these things it be it behaves exactly like one single code would do without coupling, okay? So there's nothing interesting happening. It's just like, you know, they have 100 coupled, but each locally sees, you know, just whatever it should see anyway. And so that behaves exactly like if I had just taken one code and, and not coupled. What's more interesting, and unfortunately this again cut off, is, is if we try now a parameter which is between this threshold here and another threshold which is the math threshold. So if you had taken this code and not decoded it iteratively, but you decoded it in an optimum fashion, there would be another threshold. And this threshold is about 48%, okay? So already fairly close to the 50%. So meaning a reason you don't achieve capacity is partially because the code is not capacity achieving. Okay, and partially it's because you don't do the correct decoding. But what is if you had been able to decode the code with, with optimum thing? And so this would be this, this is 40, this is about 43, 48%, and now let's see what happens. Okay, so we start it again, nothing happens. Okay, okay, so you can see it gets stuck where actually the, this is exactly where it gets stuck, where the usual code would get stuck, okay? But because it does better at the boundary, you can see that starting from the boundary, um, it does exactly this, you know, this is exactly this, this crystallization process. So there's the nucleus, the seed that's on the side, and now you see the wave that comes in and actually does the decoding, okay? And it turns out that with this, and we'll talk about this then in detail, up to the map threshold, you will actually now be able to decode, okay? The map threshold is the same as the map threshold of the underlying one. And now, of course, if, you, if I try to go even beyond, uh, right, then of course nothing interesting will happen if I do above the map threshold, even the map decoder couldn't do anything, I will just get stuck somewhere, okay? So um, this is just a different view, it's the same thing. As a function of the parameter, as soon as I'm above, nothing happens. This is just from the left to the right and from the right to the left. But as soon as I go below the map threshold, suddenly you will see that these things move in, okay? These, these are again the same decoding curves that you've seen before. And these things moves in as soon as you below the, what the map threshold can do, and it actually does the decoding, okay? Good, so now, um, just a final physics ana analogy. So I showed you the water bottle and this, and this is also something that probably many of you have seen. YouTube, this is super cooled water. Again, it's, it's below freezing, but it's not frozen if you put it in a very uh, clean bottle, okay? Uh, but as soon as in this case you just tap it, it will start, okay, and you can see the instantaneous freezing here, and this is exactly the same thing, okay? So this is really the same thing. This is not just some analogy. You know, mathematically, if you, if you make a model for this and make a model for this, this is described by the same, uh, by the same math, yes? What is this axis? This, this axis here? Yeah, so this is just, I didn't uh, mention it here. This is just a compact representation of the same code. This is called a protograph. It's just, it's, it's just a yet another way of showing what this code is. Um, it's just, you can see here, so this is the length, and you can see here that every node has whatever, the, this every check node has maybe degree six, I can't even see it, and I don't know what the degree here is. It just shows what, it, each of them corresponds to one code that we saw beforehand, and basically you get the real code by taking a, a graph cover, so by taking many copies of this thing, uh, you know, maybe taking 100, 200,000 copies, and then connecting these copies locally. Okay, it's just yet another way of showing the same code. Ah, I see. So these are the hundred. These are the hundred. These are the spatial positions. These are hundred spatial positions. So this is a spatially coupled code with a hundred. Okay, with a hundred uh, positions. Okay, and in every position, um, you you see these dots are in every position how locally the error probably looks like, right? And so. Um, okay, thank you. Is it, is it clear? So, 
So what happens is there's not really, uh, right now, in practice you do it differently, but you actually run it everywhere, but nothing happens in the middle until it sees the boundary approaching. Okay, so, so what happens is that if you, if once you start the decoding, in the middle you, you're basically always running the algorithm, but it, it's stuck. But at a boundary things get started, and then at a speed that you can also compute, it moves in, okay? And, and really the coding only is happening at this boundary when the boundary comes in and decodes, okay? So in practice, you will not even run the coding in the middle because you know it's completely useless until, until you get to the critical phase. Make sense? Good. Um, so for especially couple codes, you know, as we said, for the three six, um, capacity is a half, so these are these, what you can achieve, so these are these map thresholds here. So you can see that this gets you fairly close already, but what's even nicer is that if you increase the degrees, you don't need to do anything, you can see that these go actually closer and closer to, um, to the threshold, okay, so you can see here. And so it's not hard to see that the rate is, that you can achieve with this is basically the capacity minus something that, some error terms that go down universally. So, so by doing this, you get codes that under iterative decoding get you universally to capacity without any, there's no design other than the degrees can't be too small. Okay, so that's nice. Why is this nice? Because if you do iterative decoding, as I told you before, and that if you wanna get close to capacity, you can choose the degrees to be something. You know, don't just pick three, six, pick different degrees. But what degrees you should pick depends on the channel. So it's not gonna be the same degrees you should pick for by an erasure channel than you should pick for some other channel. Versus here, this is universal, okay? You don't need to know anything uh, about the channel. Uh, this will work universally for any, any such. Okay, and so um, they're currently, maybe I can show you something. There are currently some companies um, um, putting this into use for optical communication, and maybe I can show you some, um, some pictures. Okay, how are we doing in time? Oh, we have here. Okay, so maybe, let, can I go 10 minutes over and then take a break and then do the other thing larger? Just, or it's up to you. It's just like, I probably still have about 10 minutes for this, and then start, is that okay? Doesn't cause trouble with the, okay. Good, so, um, okay, so now, what is then the next big chance? So asymptotically, for very large codes, for very large block lengths, there are many ways now to get close to capacity, right? So a real challenge now is to do this for relatively short block lengths, um, you know, again, driven by applications, uh, internet of things, uh, you know, real-time control of, uh, of critical processes, et cetera. And so um, this means what we should really not look like is the following. Um, if you look at these curves, okay, traditionally information encoding fear has spent a lot of time at looking slices that go like vertically down, okay? And this is what's called uh, the error exponents, right? So people have looked at of how fast can I drive the error probability to zero as the block length tends to infinity. Right? And so the whole books written about the error exponents and certainly many theses written about the error exponents, et cetera, okay? Now, um, my claim is that engineering-wise, it's probably more useful to look at horizontal slices, okay? Engineering-wise, once you have an error probability of 10 to the minus whatever, you know, whatever you want, five in storage is maybe 15, but once you have that, right, you're not interested in bringing it down to 10 to the minus 200, okay? Uh, I mean, there are many events, okay? Uh, catastrophic earthquakes, blah, blah, blah. Someone just pulls out the, uh, the plug from the machine and so on that are much higher than that, right? So, but what is important is the following is like, so this is, you're, you're looking at, you know, this is let's say the capacity here. This is curves for certain block lengths. And so this is what something called the, the scaling exponent, and I'll, I'll show you in a second. You're looking at how this gap decreases as a function of n, okay? So I take an n, and I give, you a, I give you something like this, okay? And now your boss says, mm, nice curve, but what, what could you do if the code was twice the length, same code, okay? Now, if you're smart, okay, then you don't need to rerun these experiments because we know a lot about how this scaling actually happens, 
Okay, and so the optimum scaling. Um, well, let, let's maybe let's maybe look at this. So, so there's something called the scaling exponent. So this is again air. This is the same curve like this. I just flipped it over. I apologize for this. So, but so this is again the fixed values, and these are different lengths. And we're looking at how this gap, okay, decreases as a function of the length here. And so, um, so this is the gap here. And what we're interested in is how this gap behaves. And this gap, uh, you know, generically behaves like n to the minus one over mu. It's, it's just because physicists come up with these scaling laws and they like to write things in very complicated ways. So that's not why it's written n to the minus mu, but n to the minus one over mu, okay? And so, it turns out, um, it's very easy to see in coding, but it turns out also generically, uh, you know, this mu cannot just be anything. So for example, in, in cases like this, this mu must be somewhere between two and six, and you would like it to be as small as possible, okay? So mu sm small means that you very quickly, as a function of n, you know, uh, half this, you know, uh, uh, make this gap small, okay? And so you can clearly see that this makes a huge difference. So depending what the mu is, you can see that you know, it makes, it, of course, a large difference what, this, what it is, right? If mu is two, of course, you're much better off than if mu is large, right? And so um, the best we can have, uh, that's very easy to see, is, is, is one over the square root of n, okay? So, so mu could be two, right? So one over square root of n is the best scaling we can hope for, right? And it's not very difficult to see why it cannot be, be better than one over square root of n. Why is that? because just the fluctuations of the channel give me fluctuations of order square root of n, right? So to so have n independent realizations of the, of the erasure probability, right? So I'll get n times, let's say, epsilon is epsilon is the mu mean, plus minus something of order square root of n, right? So it can just be that the channel, the code could be perfect, but the channel itself gives fluctuation of square root of n, and so it could just be that the channel is, you know, is, I mean, that is slightly bad, and that simply will get me above, the, push me above capacity because the channel is atypically bad, right? And so I cannot do better than a mu is equal to two. And so uh, the question is, you know, how does these things behave? And if we're looking at the various codes, um, so the optimum is that, um, so, okay, so here's, I do it the other way around. So before it was the gap as a function of n, now here's n as a function of the gap, okay? Just inverting this thing. So the two corresponds here that the n has to grow like one over this gap squared. So if I wanna, if I wanna achieve a certain gap, and now I wanna achieve half the gap, okay? Then it means the block length has to grow by a factor four, right? Because it's one over n squared. That's the best thing I can do. But um, like polar codes, for example, this depends on the channel, but this is somewhere around four, okay? So um, it's considerably worse. So it means that if I don't do anything special to polar codes, the block length has to be roughly the square, like the optimum block length here. Um, spatially coupled, it's, it's three. So it's not quite as good as the squared. It's a little bit better than that. Um, and LBC codes, it's square. But unfortunately, that's not the convergence to the capacity. It's the convergence to the threshold of the code. So, and in general, the threshold is not the capacity, okay? So currently, we don't have actually a code for which we know and we can decode that achieves capacity and also achieves it with the smallest possible lengths that we can have, and that would be a very important. And so, because of that, um, people, yes, sir, what's the question? Sorry. Uh, there's, I just put, Take some, yeah, there are many papers on this kind of thing, okay. So, yeah, sorry, I mean, I just took three out here, but then, let me, yeah. I mean, what is the mean? Can you do it optimally? No, this one is achievable, no, this one is achievable. So, so random codes would do that. Uh, it's not achievable for low complexity, you know, it's not achievable. Right now we don't know a family that we, that we know how to decode, uh, let's say, you know, in, in low complexity, however you want to define it as a function of, of the delta. Complexity. Yeah, as a decoding complexity. So random linear codes with optimum decoding will do that, okay? And we know even the, con we don't just know this, we know the exact constants of the channel, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the ones that, we, that, that are kind of easy to decode, 
have complexity as a function of delta that's you know somehow a polynomial in 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 this in this in this deltas here these kind of family they don't do that okay none of them achieves the optimum skill yeah so this is a, so what happens is here is the following the actual it achieves in principle the capacity the problem is because you have a rate loss at the boundary okay and if you figure out what's the optimum so so you, you have kind of you have a tension between how long you make the chain okay the longer you make the chain the less the rate loss is but the longer the block length is and if you try to figure out is how much you know how short you should make it so that that the gap you know that the finite length gap is as small as possible you come up with the third power okay so that doesn't mean you couldn't find other constructions, but the construction that the standard construction will give you the third power here. Yeah, yeah. You, you're talking about the LDBC codes, or? Don't you? You're talking about this. And you're talking about this polar? So polar, it depends on the channel. So we kind of know upper and lower bounds on this, on this scaling exponent for each channel. And, um, and the best one is the BC, the easiest, that's the 3.65, for which we, we know the number. For the other ones, we have bounds and can compute things. But we know that you know, it's somewhere around, for example, BSC is the worst, and it's roughly this number here. Okay. So this is not exact, so we don't have the precise numbers for other channels, but we kind of know the range. It, does it answer your question? Okay. Good. So, um, and so, yeah, so, okay, that's just a silly joke, okay. So, um, so that brings us back to the origin and brings us back to the second topic that I want to discuss, and that's classical codes, okay. Uh, classical codes like BCH codes, Read Miller codes, they have actually some pretty good minimum distance, right? That's after all why they were introduced in the first place. Um, uh, but there are many, you know, questions that we still have. And so the first question is even if they're capacity achieving or not. The second big question is what is the error exponent, right? And the third big question would be how can you how can you efficiently decode them? Okay. And I'll talk at least I just talk about the first um, two a little bit, not not about the last one. Um, and it turns out that some of these classical codes for, um, you know, for, for uh, applications where latency is crucial might at the end be actually the codes to pick. Um, and so here, rather than having physics as inspiration, um, we'll use some very classical um, results from computer science, and this will be in the second half of the course, okay? Uh, so this is just to show you that uh, polar codes, if you look at put polar and read middle codes, then um, this is what polar codes do, and you know, and not changing anything, just the code itself. This is what read middle codes do here. And this solid curve is actually, this is just one experiment of length of 1,000 binary ratio channel. And the solid curve is actually the finite length bounds that we have from Polyansky and Verdu, which give us the optimum trade-off between um, the, um, you know, the, the error probability and the length and the channel. And you see that at least for experiments like this, read molar codes seem to be doing very well, right? And might actually be, be a class of codes that has the optimum trade-off, okay? Good, so um, sorry for going over time. Um, you know, this, this is a nice slide I stole from Dan Castello. Uh, these are some of the people that have worked on on many of these issues, um, you know, going back to the 50s, um, seeing that many people have spent quite some time on that. Um, and so that brings me to the end. And when we come back, I'll start with the first thing. And the first thing will be um, area theorem and exit charts. Okay? And then see you tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs>